What's up everyone, it's Alex Yu, and I get to serve as the Student Ministry Coordinator here at Eastern Hills. We're so glad you guys decided to join us today. We've got an exciting service planned out for you. We got in some worship and we're hopped into our fourth installment of our Ouch! That Helps message series with Pastor Dre. We're glad you guys decided to join us once again. So let's get started. Well, good morning, Eastern Hills. My name is Austin Mosden. and so glad you guys joined us today for worship. Want to welcome you in person and online, and even you out in the lobby if you guys want to come join us. Uh, before we get started for worship today, we've got a call to worship from Psalm 95, 1 through 2. It says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. And that's why we gather today. We gather to hear a message, to hear God's word, but we also gather to sing these songs and praises onto our Father in heaven. So would you stand and would you sing with us as we worship this morning? Shout out 
something I've been wrestling with this week is the dichotomy of how we can never fully understand God, and yet he calls us to know him. 
He's never changing and he's always constant and yet he's eternally complex. In fact, if we could understand him this side of heaven, I really don't think he'd be a God worth following. And there's a line in the song that we're about to sing that says, songs cannot discover, teachings won't convey, our hearts, they cannot fathom all you have for us. Our hearts cannot fathom the goodness of the grace that God gives us, and yet it is completely available, always abundant for us. Friends, the fact that I'm standing here right now in front of you is proof enough that his grace is sufficient for today, and I know I'm not the only one in this room who has the same story. And so as we sing this song, my prayer and my challenge to you is that you would wrestle with what his abundant grace looks like for you today. Whether you haven't seen that breakthrough yet and you're praying for it, God, please show up for me in this. Or you've seen it time and time again and you can rest in the goodness of his grace. I challenge you, lean into him because his arms are open wide. Our job is to just lean into him. And so wherever you're at, I pray that even if just for this song, even if just for this moment, you would fully surrender to him and take in everything that he's got for you because his grace is sufficient for today. Would you sing this with us? The songs cannot discover, teachings won't convey. Our hearts, they cannot fathom all you have for us. Your promises won't falter, your word will never fade. We're singing as we wait for all you have for us. Grace and grace. Grace like one.
Let's pray. Father, we praise you for being one, that despite the fact that your word says that we fall short, that there's this thing that's, that we call sin that separates us from you. You're a God that showers us with your grace and showers us with your mercy, that there's new compassions every single day that you have for us, that we get to rest in that unwavering truth. Father, we praise you for the sanctifying work of your son, Christ Jesus on the cross, for which we have purpose for our lives. And now we get to live for him, Father. We love you. Father, help us to be a church that is known for extending grace to others as you have extended grace to us, Father. And as we open up your word and truth today, we're praying. We're praying for you to move through it because we believe that it's alive, it's living, it's active, it has the power to change us from the inside out. So would you move through the spirit that's in Trey, that's in all of us today, that his words be clear so that you would be glorified. And as we receive your offering, it's yours, Lord. We give it back to you. Everything belongs to you. But would you use it to transform Central New York? Would you use it to reach even beyond to other parts around the world that more and more people would fall in love with your son, Jesus, because of our generosity and trusting you? We pray all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, you may be seated. Well, church, it's, it's really good to be with everybody here this morning. If, if it is your first Sunday hanging out with us, or if you're at home online checking for the first time, my name's Rob, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Eastern Hills. And throughout this year, we've had this rhythm through the New City Catechism, and, and that's a simple tool. Sometimes there's a lot of questions when it comes to this, this journey of following Jesus. And so this is a gift from us to you. It's available in the Connection Center, and each week there's a question and an answer. And this week's question is important. What is baptism? And it's a reflection of what we see from a commandment from Jesus in which he said to go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there's a purpose behind that. Why participate in baptism? It's this reminder here that baptism is the washing with water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it signifies our adoption into Christ, our cleansing from sin, and our commitment to belong to the Lord and to his church. And we aspire to be the type of church that celebrates often. Hey, if heaven's throwing parties, why shouldn't we? And so next week, we get to celebrate life change. People stepping forth and publicly declaring their trust and allegiance to Jesus. So make sure you're here. Bring a friend or two. And if you're ready to take that step and to be baptized, we've got a tool for you. It's called the connection card. We'd ask for you just to fill it out. Say, hey, I want to get baptized, and we'll call you this week and walk alongside you in that process. And if you're wondering, how do I get involved here or connect, fill out that card. And every week on Thursdays, we send out a reminder of all the great ways that you can engage here at Eastern Hills. Now, as the guest services team comes forward, we receive today's offering. One of the things that's true about generosity is that it stretches us. And what's also true is that nobody makes a difference by staying comfortable, and neither will we. And so we want to be generous with our lives, our time, our talent, and our treasures. Because when we're generous in that way, we make a difference. And one of the ways that we're going to be generous this Thanksgiving is our third annual Bring a Turkey to Church Day. And so if you've participated in this in the past, um, our goal this year is 150 turkeys. We're partnering with the Vineyard Church and their side out at Westcott. They have a food pantry there. And so we want to make a way for families to have a turkey this Thanksgiving. So next week, bring a turkey to church. I can't wait to see how God can use this act of generosity for people to think about hope in Jesus. Now today, uh, we get to hear from Pastor Trey, our executive pastor of ministries here, as we continue our series out that helps through the book of Revelation. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and grab that now and let's turn our attention to the screens.
Well, good morning, Eastern Hills. Again, my name is Trey Sweat. I get to be one of the pastors here at Eastern Hills Bible Church. And thank you for being here. If you're new, if this is your first time, we're so glad that you're here, a part of our service. If you're watching online, we would love to know where you're from, where you're at, how we can walk alongside you as well. That connection card that we've talked about, it's also on our website at easternhills.org. Go to Next Steps and you can fill that out. Um, But before we jump into today's uh, message, Something really big happened yesterday and it was somebody's birthday. It was actually our lead pastor, Rob Ryerson's birthday. Yes, it was, um, he didn't know I was gonna do this. Uh, It was a significant birthday. I won't say which one, but we got to celebrate him on Thursday as a staff. And he's a pretty impressive guy. And you can see from this, he's quite the marksman. So watch this right here. Boom, bullseye. We gotta watch it one more time. This was happening over and over as we were doing this on Thursday. One more time, boom, thanks. (laughs) Yeah, give it up for Rob. So grateful for you, grateful for your leadership, grateful that God brought you and your family here. And um, it's fun to get to work with you. And and so if you haven't got a chance, uh, take a minute, tell him happy birthday. When I was in high school in the early 2000s, there were two teams. There was Team Brittany, Brittany Spears, and there was Team Christina Aguilera. I happened to be Team Christina. And there was a song that she came out with in the early 2000s called Beautiful. Do you remember that song? I'm I'm just gonna read through these lyrics. I would sing it, but I gotta save my voice here for the message. But she says, I am beautiful no matter what they say, words can't bring me down. I am beautiful in every single way. Yes, words can't bring me down. Oh no. So don't you bring me down today. And those words became an anthem for all kinds of people. It was sung all over the place. If you turn the radio, that song was on. And it's a great song to sing. It's fun to sing. And it's a fun idea to think about, but it's not really true. Not everything is beautiful. Words do matter. Words can bring us down and it's just not true. On Tuesday night, like a lot of families with kids, it was trick trick or treat and our kids, they were all out in the neighborhood and they brought back so much candy. And at our house, every single year, they take those bags of candy and they dump it out on the kitchen table or they dump it out in the floor and they start counting pieces and making trades and just trying to figure out what all happened that night, what all they have, what they're excited about. And there's always the question, can I have a piece of candy, right? And we're, we try to be good parents. And so we don't just say, hey, eat as much candy as you want, go for it. You make the decision, no. We say, hey, one piece of candy now, let's have dinner. We can have a few pieces after that. Or or we say, hey, three pieces of candy. We give some instruction. We give some clarity. We give some information. It's really fun because out in our parking lot here at the church, it's a big area. And a lot of parents bring their teenage kids to teach them how to drive. And it's pretty comical at times. You see them learning how to parallel park and practice blinkers and getting out and checking the car. And just a few weeks ago, I walk out the front door and there's a Jeep Wrangler and it's starting and stopping, starting, stopping. You hear grinding going on and I'm like, what is happening? And I look and there's a dad in the passenger side. And then in the driver's side is a teenage daughter learning how to drive a stick shift. That dad did not take the keys and throw them to his daughter and was like, hey, go test it, go figure it out. I'll see you in a little while, it'll be great. No, a lot of things would get tore up if that was the case. There would be destruction. And so what's, what's great about God's word and what's really great about the book of Revelation is Jesus is speaking through John and he's giving a lot of clarity. He's giving a lot of instruction. He's giving a lot of warning. Hey, here's the guardrails. Here's what you need to see. Here's what you need to do so that destruction doesn't happen. Things aren't always beautiful. There's hard things. There's, this is a broken world with broken people. And we're gonna see that today. And I, that's my prayer for today is that when we read God's word, that we would be in awe of his word, but we would also see what he's trying to say. And we would apply that to our lives. So I wanna pray for us. And then we're gonna get into our text this morning. God, we're so grateful 
for how you love us. God, we're grateful that your presence is here in us and with us. And God, as we look at your word today, God, we wanna be obedient. We wanna submit to your truth. And God, we're so grateful that there is grace where there's those gaps. God, we're so thankful for your mercy that you've shown us through sending your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we're also grateful for, for Rob and getting to celebrate him this last week and thankful for his leadership here at our church. But God, as we read today, help us to be in awe of who you are. But God, also help us to understand what you're saying so that we can apply it to our lives. It's in your name that we pray these things, amen. So this series that we've been in, Rob has done a great job over the last few weeks unpacking this for us. And when we find ourselves butting up against truth, against something that's true, and it's not what we believe or we're not following that truth, it hurts, it stings when there's correction, when there's instruction at times, because we like to do what we wanna do, and so it hurts. But our hope is throughout this series is that it's not an ouch that hurts, it's an ouch that helps because Jesus has shown his love for us by dying on a cross. He's shown his love for us by giving us his words. He's shown us his love through giving us his Holy Spirit. And so, yes, it stings. Yes, it's painful at times when there's correction, but it's in love and it helps because it's better. His truth is better. And so in week one, the ouch that helps message was to the church of Ephesus. And it was, it's better to have no church than an unloving church. How will the world know who we are? How will the world know the church is by our love? And week two for the church of Smyrna, it's better to let a church suffer than to prevent it. When we follow Jesus, it's against the grain. It's uncomfortable, it's painful at times. There's suffering that happens but Jesus is with us. In week three for the church in Pergamum, it's possible for a church to stand with Jesus while not being for Jesus. We wanna stand with and for Christ. Now, if you haven't been here the last few weeks, you're like, hey, I'm not for sure what all that means. You can catch up. You can go to our website. You can watch a message online. You can catch our podcast, EHBC podcast, and get caught up in our series. But today, For part four, we are looking at the church of Thyatira. And the ouch that helps message is this. It's possible for a church to wrongly value staying together over staying faithful. There's times in our life where we just really want to be together. We don't wanna ruffle feathers. We don't wanna mess relationships up. We wanna be together. And sometimes that can be greater than our desire to stay faithful faithful to Jesus, faithful to his word, faithful to his teaching, faithful to the call that he's placed on our life. It's easy to drift towards comfort. It's not easy to drift sometimes towards that truth. And when you walked in this morning, you received a card and on that card, it says decoding revelation. We had this last week, it's a great tool, but it's just a quick reference to help what's complicated, maybe be a little more clearer for us. And when you look at that on one side, there's some words and phrases and it gives some explanation for what those are. And then on the back side, it gives you that scripture with that infused in it so that it maybe just becomes a little more understandable. And I'm gonna do my best this morning to walk through this text and help us see that there's some things we can grab a hold of. There's some things that are useful for us today. Yes, it's a text that was written to them, but it's written for us. It's important to remember that, especially in Revelation, we can read it and we're like, I don't really know what's going on and you just keep trucking through, but there's some very important things that are written for us today, for our church today, for you today, for your home. And we wanna get there this morning. And so as we walk through this text, I wanna try to give a little bit of context. And I also wanna explain what John is doing. John is writing something that is beautiful. It's unbelievable what he's writing in the book of Revelation. And it seems wild and crazy, but how he's mixing the context of the people in that day with scripture references from the Old Testament. Sometimes when you read one word, it's meaning two different things. It's crazy. As one theologian said, it's almost like he had help. And he did have help. 
Jesus is speaking these words to John. John is recording this for the church then and for the church today. So let's get a little bit of a backstory here, a little bit of history, a little bit of catch up where we're at. When you look at this map, we've seen this before in our series, you have this group of seven cities that represent these seven churches that John is writing to. And they all follow a main road. So we've hit Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos, and now we're at Thyatira. Thyatira, it's the smallest city of all of these churches. And it's the fourth city that John is writing to. In scripture, numbers always matter. And it's no different here. When you look at seven churches, and this happens a lot in scripture, there's some parallels between the first and seventh church and the second and sixth church and the third and fifth church. And then you have this church, the fourth letter to the fourth church. It's the longest letter. There's some things in this letter that are different from the rest of the letters because it has a message that's speaking to all of those churches and all of churches today. It's significant that it's placed here in the middle. Thyatira, it was on the main road. It started out as a military outpost. It was full of hard working blue collar people. When you look at the history of Thyatira, it has one of the largest registry of guilds ever preserved, working and trade guilds. What does that mean? A guild is like this mixture of a labor union mixed with a fraternity. And so you have the protection of the guild, but you also have this deep brotherhood and almost kind of ritualistic thing going on in these guilds. And it was very much mixed in with pagan worship and the worship of the gods of the time. It was a big deal to be a part of a guild. And this city had so many people that were a part of it that they exported stuff all across the region. You had blacksmiths and bronze smiths and shoe cobblers and candle makers and leather workers and all kinds of things. And their top thing that they produced was bronze. That's what they were known for. They were great bronze smiths. And when you look in a little bit deeper into this area, the God that they worship, the chief God, every city kind of had a God that they looked to. This one particularly had a God who was named Tyrimnos. And he was a son of Zeus. And it wasn't a God that everybody worshiped. He was kind of a lesser known God. And historians think that the reason that they worshiped this God was because they were a working class people. You think about Pittsburgh or Detroit and factories and like these people that have grit. They didn't want the guy that everybody else liked. They wanted their own guy. The kind of underdog was who they worshiped. At the time you had the Roman emperor Domitian that was ruling. You even have these coins. On one side is Domitian. And on the other side of this coin was one of his sons that had passed away. And his son is sitting on this, 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 Uh, planet and he's being deified. They're trying to deify the sun that had passed away. And there's these seven stars around it. And so some people would worship this Tyremnos God, but also some people look to Domitian as a God. All of this worship was going on in this region where this church, this church that followed Jesus was planted right in the middle of it. The last thing that I wanna share before we read the scripture, and this was just really interesting, is there was this Jewish prophetess that was written about. And she was a Jewish prophetess in this area. And she was a Sibyl shrine. What is that? Well, in these bigger cities, there was these shrines or temples that you would go to. And there was prostitutes and pagan worship. And you would go with your problems and your questions and you would want help. And you would go here and you would do these ritualistic things and traditions and hoping to better your life or get an answer that you need or to cure a disease you had or to become, to have a kid if you weren't able to have a kid. And she was a prophetess that was very much a part of all of these things. And if you were a Sibyl shrine in a smaller city, it was kind of like a minor league shrine. It was like the Syracuse Mets. They're not the pros, but they're pretty good. So you could go there if you didn't wanna travel to a place like Ephesus or Smyrna, and you would go there to get help from all of these different ways of worshiping, all these different gods to get what you needed when you needed it. And all of this was going on in this city of Thyatira where this church was planted. And so we're gonna read this text. And as we read it, it's important for us to have some of that framework because John is speaking directly to the culture. He's also referencing things from the past in God's story. 
He's pointing to things in the future and it all is useful for us today. It's wild that God uses his word that way. So if you would, turn to Revelation 2. We're gonna start in verse 18. And we're gonna take our time walking through this this morning and hopefully pull out a few of these things to get us to a place where we can apply God's word to our life. And so when we start here in verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the son of God. It's a huge statement right off the bat in this letter. It's the only time that we see son of God in all seven letters. And it shows up again at the end of Revelation in chapter 22. But there's this statement that Jesus himself, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, Lord and Savior, King of Kings is speaking these words. Listen, it's what it means. Stop, listen, the son of God is speaking. Some theologians even talk about some of the context here, right? Who did they worship in this city? They worshiped the son of Zeus. Who was on the coin? A son of Domitian. Some are even saying that this is kind of a trump guard. No, I, a trump card. No, I am the son of God. I am the one when I speak, you listen. The son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. And maybe you can get this picture in, in your mind of what's happening here, this this picture of awe and strength and power. It comes from Daniel chapter 10. Daniel's talking about this God who is strong and mighty because what's happening to God's people at the time, they're persecuted, they're exiled in Babylon and they're having to persevere through something really hard and they're looking to God who is strong and mighty, who's worthy of our praise. We sing about it this morning, we exalt him. What's wild though, is the city of Thyatira. Remember, they're known for their bronze work. Their biggest export was burnished bronze. It's speaking to them in the moment, but it means so much greater. In verse 18. Now verse 19, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service and perseverance. This was a church who lived in a place where it wasn't okay to be a Christian. It wasn't the normal thing. They knew what it meant to follow Christ He's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. They had made that commitment. They were experiencing persecution. And God knows this, Jesus knows this. And so he's speaking directly to their service and their perseverance. You're doing a good job. You have been doing a good job. But he also says that you are now doing more than you even did at first. They didn't just stop, they're still growing in their faith. Verse 20, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. So he speaks of the good stuff and then he has a but moment, right? But nevertheless, I have this against you. You have started to tolerate this person named, not named Jezebel, this is just a reference. It could be talking about the lady that we talked about that was the Sybil Shrine. Maybe it's that but it's for sure referencing some things in the Old Testament. And you go all the way back to King Solomon. So you have King David, who is the person that all of Israel had been waiting for, the king that was gonna bring everything together. And David was a man after God's own heart, but he wasn't perfect. And towards the end of his kingship, things got a little shaky. And he was going, he wanted to build the temple But King Solomon, his son, was the one who was commissioned to build the temple of God, this place where the spirit of God was gonna live, where people would come from all over the land to come and worship and to bring their sacrifices, this place that was to be holy. And one of the things that God asked King Solomon to do was to build this temple with God's people, use their gifts, use their talents. Well, King Solomon didn't quite do that. He went to the Phoenicians And he made a deal with them. If you'll bring your bronze smiths and you'll bring your stone cutters, I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you 20 towns. And we know what happens when this happens because it's happening today. Two people with two different sets of beliefs, two styles of worship, two worldviews are now living in the land together and years pass and there's conflict. And in order to make a treaty, the Israelites think it would be a really great thing to marry their king, King Ahab, to the high priestess, Jezebel. What was she the high priestess of? Asherah worship. 
which has all kinds of sexual immorality and debauchery connected to it. It's connected to Baal worship, which is child sacrifice. And Israelites, God people marry into all of this. And you can see this isn't good. This is where the wheels come off the bus for the Israelite people. They're divided, they're torn in two and Babylon comes and they're exiled. And all of a sudden, everything has gone out the window for God's people. And the Jewish writers, they point it all the way back to King Solomon. He drifted from God's instruction. He tolerated some things that God said, don't do that. And all of a sudden a drift happened and it ended horribly. John is referencing that here. Jezebel who calls herself a prophet by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. It shows up all throughout scripture. This drift to worship what I want, what is self-serving. This is what she's leading people towards and to. And so we see the response here. Verse 21, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Even in this hard instruction, we see God's kindness. What does he say? I have given her time to repent. She's heard the truth. She knows about me. I've given her time, but she's unwilling. So what happens? I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. This word bed in the Greek, it means like a recliner. And it's the same word that's used when historians are talking about these guilds, when they would meet for their traditions and rituals. There was this reclining couch where all of this sexual immorality would happen. What God's saying is this thing that you've been a part of, I'm gonna cast you on that bed of suffering. I'm gonna make those who commit adultery, those who follow you, those who adhere to your teachings, those who listen to you, they're gonna suffer intensely along with you unless they repent of her ways. Again, you see God's kindness. There's a choice here. There's a chance. If you hear my word and you submit to my truth and repent, you won't have to suffer like this. Verse 23, it gets even a little bit harder. I will strike her children dead. That's a really hard thing to hear. It's pointing again back to the story of Jezebel in the Old Testament. God gets really tired and fed up with what's going on. Jezebel is thrown out of a window. All of her kids are struck down dead. He's pointing to that and he's saying, if this continues, I am going to end this. I've given you warning after warning after warning, but there's a consequence. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Maybe this makes you think, of Psalm, Psalm 139, verse 23, that, that God search me, know my hearts, know my anxious thoughts. It's also from Jeremiah 17, that our God is a God who is looking, searching for those who know his truth and will submit to it. And that's who he wants to build his kingdom with. Our God is omniscient, he's all knowing, he's searching, he's looking for those and he will repay each of you according to your deeds. Verse 24, now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching, those who have not learned, so not everybody's following this and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. That's an interesting phrase and we don't, we're not for sure what all of that means, but it definitely doesn't mean anything good. It means that they've mixed some things together. They've mixed all kinds of beliefs and thoughts. It's kind of an everything goes type mentality. And he says, those who haven't learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. He's coming, he's coming again. Verse 26, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like property. So what is he speaking to? 
This is again, a reference to the Old Testament. When you read Psalm and you see this language about this promise to rule, to rule with Christ, to rule in this kingdom that is to come. Everybody was wrapped up in King David and that was the kind of king they were looking for. But what God is saying that if you'll follow me, if you'll do my will to the end, I'm gonna give you authority over the nations. And it's far greater than that kind of king, that kind of rule. You're gonna rule with me just as I have received authority from my father, you're going to receive authority. You're gonna reign with me forever and ever. And then when we get to the end of this passage in verse 28, I will also give that one the morning star. I'm gonna gonna let that one experience glory, awe, authority with me. In Numbers 24, it points to this star is gonna rise and it's speaking of Jesus Christ. We're gonna reign with him forever. Verse 29, whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. And so let's unpack this a little bit. In this passage, Jesus is demonstrating that Thyatira was good. They were a good church. They persevered, they loved people, they cared for one another. They were the kind of church, if you came in the doors, you would feel welcomed, you would feel like you belong, you would feel like you're a part of something that's that's good. But at some point in this story, this devotion to making things good and loving one another starts to drift. This was a church that had a heart for Jesus and people. They knew the gospel. They wanted to apply that to their lives. And whatever happened in this story, whatever this teaching was, whatever people were drifting towards and beginning to tolerate was not what God wanted. And it was derailing them from what they were meant to do. Maybe you've heard of the church of Thyatira before. In Acts 16, Paul is preaching the good news and he comes and he meets this woman named Lydia. It says that Lydia, she was a a trader. She traded dyes and color and a purple cloth and she was from Thyatira and her whole family accepted Christ and was baptized. It's thought that maybe she was the one who went back to her hometown and began sharing the gospel and it began to start a movement which became a church. They were founded on the gospel. They knew the love of Christ. But just like in all these three previous letters, something happens here. The message is they were valuing the staying together, valuing, trying to keep things all together more than they were valuing staying faithful to Jesus, faithful to the gospel, faithful to doctrine. When we hear the word doctrine, what does that mean? It, it, it's a set of beliefs. It, it grounds us. It's our foundation. Our church here has a doctrine. Maybe you've read it before. We have a statement of beliefs. We have a document that goes over our theological convictions and it helps ground us to God's word so that we don't sway from it. We don't drift from it. And that doctrine isn't just important for this platform. It's important for our kids' environment. It's important for our student environment. It shows up in our classes, in our small groups, in our one-on-one conversations with each other. Doctrine matters because the more we have the truth of God, the more we know about God and the more we start to live the way he wants us to live. Those things matter. And whatever was going on in this story, they were starting to drift from this doctrine that they were founded on, this set of beliefs that the gospel and the gospel alone is true. Christ, Christ alone, nothing else matters. We're following him. They started to drift from this. They started to tolerate other beliefs and thoughts. They adopted the mindset that love equals unconditional affirmation. And even worse than that, they started to allow the openness to this idea that all things maybe are good or there's other ways to think about this to be taught in and throughout the church. The message is one of blind love and undiscerning openness. This allowance of things like idolatry, sexual immorality, bad doctrine, gospel-ish doctrine might be best summarized in these words. Worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness look 
strange. At one point in time, this church, they were all about Jesus, but things started to drift. And when you've experienced drift in your life, I know I have, sometimes we don't notice it. It takes a little while for us to recognize that some things that used to be not normal have become normal in my life. And the same thing was going on in this church. As I was just getting ready for today, I came across a stat. And this was a Gallup poll that was done this last year. And I think it plays a lot into what what we're talking about. How do we apply this? What does this mean for us today? Where do we see this drift at times in our own life or in our own churches? And this was the stat. 25% of Christian adults, adults who profess their faith in Christ, they believe that the Bible is the actual word of God. 25%. The actual word of God. It's perfect. 17% of Christian adults believe that the Bible is an ancient book of fables, professing Christians. And then the 58% in between have all kinds of mixtures of that belief. And you wonder why at times there's drift. If I don't believe the word of God is true, if I don't believe that God is who he says he is, how on earth will I live a life that's submitted to the truth of God? I can't, I can't do that. We've even seen this play out in churches. Maybe you've heard the stories of Mars Hill and the drift that happened over years or a documentary over Hillsong, the drift that happened over years or pastor after pastor after pastor who's had an affair and it didn't just happen overnight. There was a drift that was taking place or a church that at one point was sold out to the gospel and find themselves drifting to a place where the word of God isn't even preached anymore. It happens all the time. Rob talked about this when we started this series, this difference between a judgmental people and a discerning people. When we're judgmental, we put ourselves above others. It's out of fear, we're trying to self-preserve, but when we discern, when we use discernment and we go to somebody in love, it's out of love that we're telling them the truth. Hey, remember what we talked about at the beginning? Don't eat all that candy because you're gonna wake up and throw up in the middle of the night. Hey, stop doing that. That's not what God wants for you. That's not what his word says. God's spirit leads us in those moments through discernment. One of the things that helps a church preserve this is when you and I make it a habit to be discerning. There's moments where you experience something or you hear something or you feel something and it just feels out of place and maybe you just don't do anything with it. Maybe you share it with the person next to you, but you don't share it with the person that you heard that from. Maybe there's something even from a platform at times, you're like, I don't know what that means. You can go to that leader, you can go to that pastor, you can go to that teacher, you can go to that friend, you can go to that spouse and say, hey, help me understand this. I'm not for sure if this lines up with what God says. Paul talks about this, test and approve my words. You do the hard work too. That's what we're called to be as a church. We're discerning, we're loving each other, we're helping each other stay accountable to God's word because the drift here for the church in Thyatira is that they're being tolerant. And what God is asking us to do is to choose truth over tolerance, to choose his word over this openness, this affirmation, everything goes, whatever's good for you is good for you. No, the word of God is true. And we submit to his word and we follow him wherever he leads us. When you think about a church like this and how good things were, you think like, how could this end up in a place where God is saying, I'm fed up with this. I'm tired of this. Maybe they didn't feel like they had the energy to deal with another problem, another controversy, another issue. Man, we've been fighting so many things. We've been persecuted for so long. We're just tired. Maybe they didn't wanna ruffle anyone's feathers. Maybe they didn't wanna hurt anyone's feelings. Maybe they didn't wanna go to this person, whoever it was who was preaching this false doctrine and draw a line in the sand and say no more. 
Maybe there were some hot potato things going on and hey, you take care of it. No, you take care of it. No, you're the one who needs to say something. Maybe this person, whoever it was, was really influential and intertwined in their personal lives through these guilds and through the church. And if they say something, maybe they lose something. Maybe they lose a job. Maybe they lose some finances. We don't know. But whatever the case was, they were avoiding this conversation. They were avoiding the discernment of speaking up out of love, saying, hey, this isn't right. We are called to be a people of discernment. We don't have to beat up on people, but we approach it like Christ with with grace and with truth. We approach someone with love and we present the truth. That's who we're called to be. And I don't know about you, but me as a believer in Jesus Christ, I need you to be that for me. I need to be that for you. That's what we're called to do with one another, to hold each other up, to hold each other accountable so that we don't forget the truth. The story of God's people as we drift often. It's the story of the Old Testament. We see it playing out in the New Testament. It's no different than today. We are a people that have to be reminded over and over and over who God is and what he's done and how he's moving and how he wants us. We have to be reminded of that. These stories, these examples, this message in the church of Thyatira, it reminds us that we can really be good at sweeping things under the rug. It's fine, it's not a big deal. It's no big issue. Maybe they didn't mean that. I shouldn't be doing this personally. I shouldn't be doing this, but it's not a big deal, it's okay. Everything we do and say matters. It's so easy to drift. We don't naturally drift towards truth, instruction, the right thing. We drift towards the wrong things. Because we know the content and the message of the gospel. We know what Jesus has done for us. We know that this is a big deal. We have to make it a big deal. There's been a lot of conviction this week for me because as I'm reading this and I'm thinking about my own life and my own walk with Christ, I drift so easily, so quickly, it happens. And all of a sudden, I am not standing in God's truth. It affects my thoughts. It affects my heart. It affects my actions. And when we're not careful with those things, what happens? It doesn't just affect me. It affects the people around me. It affects my marriage. It affects my kids. It affects my friendships. It affects the church. It's how big a deal it is. We have to choose truth over tolerance. Some good news. The church at Thyatira, just like the Old Testament stories that we read and talked about today, they tolerated things that God detested. And they saw this drift and we know that God's truth, it has to be at the center of our lives. And the promise is, is that those in the church of Thyatira and the church today, those who submit to God's truth, they will receive enduring, intimate and eternal fellowship with Jesus Christ. It's true. We get to reign with him forever when we submit to his truth. And so it leads us to a couple of questions this morning and they're good questions. Where are you choosing tolerance over truth? because we're called to choose truth over tolerance. Maybe it comes to the claims of Christ. You've heard the claims of Christ, that he is the one true God. He died for you. He paid for your sin, that he is the son of God, that he lived on this earth and he was fully human, fully man. And it just seems like a lot, but you, you've heard it. And you're like, I don't know if that's the one thing. 
I don't know if that's the right thing. Maybe in this moment, God's saying, hey, I want you to choose my truth. I wanna know you. Maybe that's a question for you this morning. This morning, like, does this mean, does this choosing truth over tolerance mean that I follow Christ for the very first time and I am known by God and I know him and I start to live a life that is built on a firm foundation of his truth? Maybe you've known Jesus for a long time and you've been choosing tolerance over truth and you've started to drift and you've started to get into some places where it's rough and it's difficult and you feel the tension all the time. God says, just choose my truth. Submit to my truth. Hey, what you've been keeping alone in your heart and your mind, end it today. Put it to death. My way is better and I'll help you. And I'll put a church around you to help you. Listen to my Holy Spirit. He'll lead and guide you. Read my word. Read scripture. Another stat, another stat. Americans today, about 60% of Americans say they're Christians. They say that. And about 35% of them say they read their Bible three to four times a day or a year. Only 10% of them read their Bible daily. Maybe for some of us, that's a great place to start. I'm gonna pick up his truth and I'm gonna start to read it. And I'm gonna start to do the work to understand it. And I'm gonna do the work to apply this to my life so that I don't drift. So my family doesn't drift. So my church doesn't drift because that's what God has called us to. So this morning, think about this. Choose truth over tolerance. And I want you to hear this. There is grace when we're not there yet. And there is mercy when we haven't found his truth yet. Jesus died on a cross for you and for me. And this morning, don't walk away from this and try to do it by yourself. Do it in community, do it with others. Let them come alongside you in this journey of choosing his truth. It's too easy for us to drift. And so this morning, if you wanna make a step, you wanna take a step in your faith, you wanna say yes to Jesus for the first time, or you wanna, you just need to do some confessing and say, I need help. I've drifted from God's truth. Let's talk to one of our pastors. I'm gonna be here at the front of the platform. I'd love to help you and walk with you. But again, my prayer has been for today that when we read God's word, we're in awe of who he is. We're in awe of who he is and we can understand it and apply it to our life. And so let me pray for us. If you would like to respond today, I'm gonna hang out here as long as I need to. A couple of reminders. We want to be connected with you. If we don't know who you are, if we haven't met you, if this is your first time, fill out that connection card. We want to get to know you, but let me pray. God, we are so grateful for our time together. God, grateful for your word that is true, that is good, that is right. God, we're so thankful that in our moments where we feel far from you, God, you haven't left us. God, we pray that this this warning, this This instruction, God, to the church in Thyatira would be one that that we think about, that we apply to our life, God, that we would choose your truth over tolerance, God, that we wouldn't drift from your goodness. God, that we wouldn't have the thinking that everything is beautiful and everything is fine because everything's not, it's broken, it's messed up. People are broken and you are perfect and you are beautiful and you are the one who changed us and we are covered by your righteousness. And God, help us to have courage to be discerning and in love to approach those who we see it, we see that they're far from you. How horrible would it be for us to live our lives when somebody has been watching us and they know we're headed down the wrong way and they do nothing to come alongside us. God, that is the church you've called us to be. We love you. We pray all of these things in your name, amen. Well, church, um, As you head out today, just a reminder, um, bring that turkey to church. I know that's kind of funny to think about, but what an awesome thing we get to do in providing a meal for those and showing the love of Jesus through something as simple as a turkey. So do that, bring that next week. Again, if you wanna take any step in your faith, I'd love to talk with you. Church, you are sent.
what an amazing service. We hope you guys enjoyed it and that the message was impactful and resonated with you right where you were at. Today, Pastor Trey used a resource called Decoding Revelation, which expounds upon the language of the book to help us understand it a little bit more. And for those of you guys online, we've got that linked in the description below. Again, we want to know the best way we can connect with you. And so we can do that by filling out the connect card online at easternhills.org under the next steps tab. We love you guys so much. We pray for you every week. Hope to see you guys next Sunday. Have a good one.